Welcome back to Ships of War, and thank you for joining us. If you enjoy deep dives into naval history, big gun engineering and the legendary battleships of the 20th century, please remember to like the video and subscribe. Before we compare the great naval guns, we need to understand one simple idea, the reason some barrels are long, and others short. Battleship guns are described by two measurements, the diameter of the shell, and the length of the barrel, expressed in calibers. For example, a 16-inch, 45 caliber gun means the barrel is 45 times the shell diameter, or about 60 feet long. A 16-inch, 50 caliber gun is even longer, around 66 feet. But why does this all even matter? That's because a longer barrel lets the expanding gases push on the shell for more time. This gives the projectile higher muzzle velocity, which means longer range, flatter trajectories, better accuracy at distance, and stronger armor penetration. However, longer barrels come with trade-offs, they weigh more, they stress the turret machinery, wear out faster, the recoil forces are greater, and lastly they were a little more complex in design and operation. So when we talk about 15-inch, 16-inch, or 18-inch naval guns, the caliber length is just as important as the diameter. Some nations preferred short, heavy guns for plunging deck fire. Others chose long, high-velocity barrels for long-range accuracy. Each design reflects a different doctrine and different philosophy of naval combat. Britain's 16-inch Mark I, fitted to Nelson and Rodney. The Royal Navy entered the interwar period with strict treaty limits. The result was the Nelson class, armed with three triple turrets, all forward, carrying the 16-inch Mark I. These guns were powerful, but also had flaws. They fired a heavy 2,048-pound shell at a relatively low velocity. The British believed in plunging fire at long range, using weight over speed to punch through decks. But the guns had dispersion problems, inconsistent accuracy, and slower turret training. Yet, when they hit, they hit hard. Rodney's destruction of Bismarck proved that these guns could shatter armor and cripple systems brutally. Their strengths, heavy shells, excellent deck penetration at long range. Their weaknesses were, poor accuracy at extreme range, mechanical design quirks, and slow ammo handling. Then came the United States Navy, with what many consider the greatest battleship guns ever made. The Iowa class carried nine 16-inch 50 caliber Mark VII cannons, firing the superb 2,700-pound super heavy shell. This gave them a balance no other navy achieved, extreme range, blistering accuracy, fast reloads, and highly sustained firing. The Mark VII could tear through face-hardened armor at almost any angle, and its ballistic performance was unmatched. And it sat in some of the best turrets and fire control systems ever built. Radar, computers, stability and weather-resistant precision. This was the battleship gun perfected. Their strengths include high accuracy, great range, an excellent rate of fire, and the best fire control system in battleship history. Their weaknesses was only that they were smaller than Yamato's 18-inch guns, but we will explain later why that really did not matter. Now France's 380mm guns, around 15 inches 45 caliber, they were sleek, modern, and had an extremely high velocity. Mounted in two quadruple turrets forward, these cannons fired fast, hit hard, and had excellent penetration at long range, thanks to their new ballistic design. But the quad turrets were complex. Mechanical failures were not unheard of, and early shells had issues before wartime fixes corrected them. Still, the French guns had impressive technical merit, combining velocity, good shell weight, and an armored turret arrangement that minimized the ship's vulnerable areas. Their strengths, high velocity, good penetration, a good modern layout. Their weaknesses, complex machinery, teething problems, slower practical rate of fire. Germany's famous 380mm guns, around 15 inches 45 caliber were not the biggest, nor the most advanced, but they were extremely reliable. Firing a lighter shell than their rivals, these weapons emphasized high velocity and excellent accuracy. 
The Germans engineered these guns for consistency, stable mountings, rugged construction, and rapid firing cycles. Bismarck demonstrated this in action, her gunnery was famously tight and precise. Their strengths, reliability, accuracy, fast firing cycles. Their weaknesses, lighter shells with reduced long-range penetration. Italy's guns, powerful on paper, limited in reality. Italy's Littorio-class battleships mounted the high-velocity 381mm, or 15-inch 50-caliber guns, firing a 1,950-pound armor-piercing shell. On paper, the Italian engineers produced one of the most impressive guns of the era. Naval penetration tables show the 381mm round could punch through around 22 to 23 inches of vertical belt armor at practical battle ranges. The guns themselves were excellent, and had around 7.5% more muzzle velocity than the German 380mm, but their shell construction held them back, a critical factor that shaped Italy's battleship effectiveness. And finally, the Japanese monsters. The largest naval rifles ever mounted on a warship. Nine 18.1-inch 45 caliber guns, firing 3,200-pound shells. These were not weapons, these were earthquakes contained within steel. But the guns were enormous, they were very slow to load, and their turrets weighed as much as an entire destroyer. At extreme range, dispersion became a problem, and Japan lacked the advanced radar fire control of the US Navy. But their strengths went unmatched as the shell weight and raw destructive power was immense. Their only real weakness was a slow rate of fire less accurate at long range, limited fire control systems and their huge weight and size. It is important to look at what real testing revealed about these weapons. Nations did not just rely on theory alone. They fired live shells at slabs of hardened armor, sometimes from full battle distance, so they could understand the true killing power of their guns. Japan's Yamato-class guns fired a 3,200-pound Type 91 shell, the heaviest naval shell ever used. Trial results showed it could break through 32 inches of face-hardened armor at close range and around 20 to 22 inches at 20,000 yards. In plunging fire, the Yamato guns were unparalleled, capable of slicing through 8 inches of deck armor at extreme distance. The United States Navy's 2,700-pound Mark VIII armor-piercing round, used by the Iowa class, proved devastating in trials. It could penetrate around 30 inches of vertical armor at close range and well over 20 inches at 20,000 yards. In deck fire tests, the same projectile punched through 5 to 7 inches of hardened deck armor, enough to reach magazines on nearly any ship afloat. Germany's 380mm shell was lighter but fired at high velocity. Tests showed it could pierce roughly 27 inches of belt armor at short range and about 17 to 18 inches at 20,000 yards. Its strength was consistency and accuracy, rather than sheer depth of penetration. For those interested in sources and more detailed data, the full citations for these figures can be found in the video description. These tests show that gun diameter was only one part of the story. Shell weight, shape, velocity, metallurgy, and even impact angle mattered just as much. Some guns were designed for long-range plunging fire, others for medium-range penetration, and others for raw destructive force at close distances. But another crucial factor was often overlooked. That was the sheer size and weight of these guns, and the amount of space they required aboard a ship. Not every navy could accommodate the largest weapons. Some nations could not make ports or channels large enough to handle them, and not every nation had the industrial infrastructure to produce the enormous shells and propellant charges that they demanded. These practical limitations heavily influenced the choice of guns, sometimes more than raw power alone. But the firm truth about these big guns remains, at the ranges where late war battleship duels were actually fought, every gun in this comparison could punch through the other's belt or deck armor. Real-world test figures and combat experience show that 15-inch, 16-inch, 
and even the massive 18.1-inch armor-piercing shells all exceeded the vertical protection carried by the great battleships of the 1930s and 1940s. In practice, there was no belt thick enough to make any ship truly immune. Factors like armor type, angle of impact, or plunging deck fire could influence individual hits, but they do not change the larger truth. And this is the part that surprises many people. As much as naval enthusiasts debate who had the biggest guns or the heaviest armor, the truth is that any of these ships could sink the others. Victory did not depend on steel alone, but on which crew spotted the target first, which ship landed the initial crippling hits, and which captain made the smarter tactical choices. In the final age of the battleship, triumph belonged to accuracy, fire control, and tactical skill from each crew member aboard. Every salvo counted, and even a single well-placed shot, sometimes from a slightly smaller caliber than the massive guns we've discussed, could decide the outcome of an engagement. From the gun decks to the bridge, every story we tell honors those who served. If this tale made you feel the salt and steel of history, give it a like, and if you're not yet part of our channel's convoy, subscribe and join the ranks, more powerful stories await.